There was a time uh, in the, I think it was the summer of 2015, or at least the northern summer of 2015, where we had Mason Cox, Alec Terriccio, and uh, we had um, Jason Holmes as well, who went on to play for St. Kilda. Of course. And um, yeah. you know, we all three of them were playing in the VFL at the same time. And there we dreamt uh, us uh, American, you know, footy aficionados of the, the possibility of not one, not two, possibly three Americans in the AFL. I'm Brian Barish from the United States Australian Football League, and you're watching Sports Legends with Bevo. Brian Barish, the media manager of the USA FL. Thanks for coming on Sports Legends with Bevo for a chat. Cheers, Bevo. Thanks for having me. So tell us about your role, what you do uh, over there in America and, and you know, in terms of promoting the sport of AFL for the men and the women over there. So I do a little bit of everything, actually. I'm, um, I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none, as they say. Well, so I'm the media manager. I do everything from social media. I do articles. Uh, I do uh, public relations. I am the in-house graphics designer. But my most, uh, my favorite part about doing the whole thing is I am the lead play-by-play -play commentator, uh, and I do that uh, a fair bit. That's that's the part that that really kind of sings to me. I like doing the other stuff and I like dealing with folks around the league, which is great. But uh, I've, I've been wanting to be a commentator since I was about eight years old and I get to live out my childhood dream. How good. We should perhaps get you uh, doing an AFL game or something uh, with your American accent. That'd be pretty cool. I'm, they do that sometimes where they get people from overseas commentating Australian games. And I reckon it's the coolest. <laughs> yeah, I um, I know that they've uh, they've mentioned that. I know people have been like, we need to get this guy on and, and everything. But uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I I I feel like that would be that would be up there. But uh, I'm happy with even just doing just just the USAFL or anybody that will have me. You know. And back in the '90s, you fell in love with the sport. Tell us about how that all happened and and what made you what made you love AFL. I saw the the game on TV. I must have been uh, like 15 years old. I came home from school one day and I was just flipping through the channels on uh, on pay TV and happened to see this sport. And I'd seen a glimpse of it early, you know, when I was much younger. But this was the first time I actually got to see what was happening, and I fell in love with it instantly. And uh, I've been following it just about ever since. I got involved. Uh, locally, I found out there was a team here in Philadelphia uh, in about 2007, 2008. By that time, I had been listening to the games on the radio for a long, long time. And uh, also, again, since 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 probably about 99 or 2000, I went to the grand final party and everybody from the local club, the Hawks, they came over and they were like, who are you? How did you find out about us? How did you find out about the club? And then they wanted me to come out and play. And I said, um, well, I'd like to, but uh, I run like a pregnant giraffe. And that's just what my dad says about me. So, uh, <laughs> but I came out the next year and I came out to a scratch match and uh, the coach came over and said, uh, do you want to be a Philly Hawk? And I said, well, don't I have to try out? And he said, uh, uh, sure, here's your tryout. Do you like, do you like Aussie rules football? I said, yeah. He said, do you want to come and play with us in a couple of weeks? I said, yeah. He said, you're a Philadelphia Hawk. Congratulations. Oh, isn't that wonderful? And obviously we're seeing guys like Mason Cox in there doing really good things for Collingwood. Um, we've seen quite a few players come from all around the world in recent years. And it's just wonderful to see this multiculturalism of, of, of AFL footballers. And un unfortunately, a late great man of mine, Alex Riccio as well, was, uh, was playing for South Adelaide. And he came on my show a number of times as a special guest and even a co-host. And, and I just remember you know, his passion for Aussie rules and, and how he'd gone from playing basketball over there in America and to coming to Australia. And he was like playing against Mason Cox. And I thought that's one of the coolest things ever. Yeah, um, I actually, our paths crossed very briefly because he actually played, uh, I think his first or second year for the New York Magpies was my last year playing for for Philadelphia. Uh, and he was, you know, he's a super nice guy and he's missed by just about everybody here in the community. But yeah, there was a time uh, in the, I think it was the summer of 2015 or at least the northern summer of 2015 where we had Mason Cox, Alec Terriccio, and uh, we had um, Jason Holmes as well who went on to play for St. Kilda. Of course, and, um, yeah. You know, we all three of them were playing in the VFL at the same time. And there we dreamt uh, us uh, American, you know, footy aficionados of the, the possibility of not one, not two, possibly three Americans in the AFL. You know, now, you know, we have a handful of Americans that are over there playing mostly at the state level. And of course, uh, you know, we have, of course, on the women's side, we have Danielle Marshall, who just signed with Essendon and not just an American recruit, but also a USAFL product, which makes it a little bit more extra special for us. Yeah, most definitely. And 
in terms of the growth of a competition since you first started playing back in the 90s, you said you started playing footy, was that right? I started playing in 2008 was my oh, first 2008 year. 2008 was your first year. You would have noticed yeah. a, a big improvement in the growth of football, both women's and men's, no doubt. Oh, absolutely. I think when I came into the league, there was about 30 teams across the country. And there was, I would say, at most half a dozen women's teams. We're up to 51 clubs. Uh, and we have um, approximately 30 of those clubs have some sort of women's program. In fact, we have two clubs uh, who are primarily women's. Uh, and they are independent of a men's team, which is which is great to see. You know, the growth has been fantastic. I think the other part of it is, even though you know, you know we had this sort of vision that we would be maybe at 10,000 members. And unfortunately, we're at about a quarter of that. But what I think compensates for it is the fact that 75% of our players are American. They're not expats. They're not, you know, uh, uh, just people coming over to look for an easy kick or anything like this. They're locals. They're people who live in the community who want to build something sustainable. And it, it's not just the players, a lot of the leadership, the presidents of these clubs are local and they are, you know, they have roots and they have families and they are going to be here for a long time and they want to be able to establish this community. So I think that's the biggest part of our growth. And then in terms of the quality, I mean, I've heard uh, some people say that our teams at the top, you know, like the Austin Crow say, or the Golden Gate Ruse, that they could compete with uh, local Australian teams and, and, and do well. So yeah, it really has come away a long way in the last 15 or so years since I came on board. I recently had a chat with Ricky Olorenshaw, who's doing wonderful things over there in Bali, um, in terms of promoting football for men and women. And and he's talk, talks about the growth of, of women's footy as well. And we know how big that's been in Australia and, and everywhere around the world, world, really. Is there any sort of like scope in the future of getting AFL players over to America to, to help, you know, with perhaps play in your competition, like what we're seeing over there in Bali at the moment? Well, I mean, the, it, it comes down to the schedule. The problem is, is that our schedules uh, run pretty parallel, uh, at least on the men's side, they do. And with the women, you know, prior to this year, there were a number of AFLW players who's come over, uh, Aaron Phillips, Sarah Perkins. Uh, we've had uh, Catherine Smith of GWS come over. And so we've had that, unfortunately, with them shifting the schedule, that's not possible at the moment. But, uh, you know, we've had, uh, I know Jessica Wuchner came over uh, in 2015 before there was an AFLW season. And she did that par uh, partly, I guess, in an anticipation of wanting to learn more about the game and expanding herself as a footballer, uh, you know, not just a player, but also as a, as a possible coach and possibly as a, a, a career path down the line. So the fact that we exist, I guess, in that aspect is very good. And I know that uh, when we've had the national teams go over for the International Cup many years ago, that there were uh, a lot of women not only uh, at the uh, professional level, but also even down to the local level as well. And, and it goes for both the women and the men who've wanted to be involved in that and, and, and help grow the game, not just qu uh, quantity-wise, but also quality-wise as well. That's wonderful to see. And in terms of your play-by-play -play commentary thing, is there a commentator like a BT or someone in Australia that you'd like to use as a bit of an influence or someone that you like to be like, I suppose? Oh, Lord. Well, I, I listened to Rex Hunt a lot growing up, which um, oh, the has been the best. both good and... The, he's the best. Yeah, which, <laughs> he, you know, he really is. And I, I think the key with that is, and, and I love, you know, I love a lot of his... It, it really made you hang on to the game. And I know that I've had other like other friends, Americans, who I'd say, you know, listen to this guy. You don't even need to know what's happening and you, you'll be entertained because he throws in all these references. I think the key is you can be entertaining and you can be, you can elicit a laugh out of people or a smile. And, and I'm just that kind of person. I, I like having fun. I like being, I like, I like being upbeat. I like being, you know, I like making jokes. But you also need to be able to inform. So I think the a good balance of that, of being enjoyable to listen to, but also being able to understand what is happening during the game, being being clear, being correct. We don't always achieve that. And I don't always achieve it because I'm not perfect. Nobody is. But that's the one thing that I do. So I, I 
Rexy, I think, really kind of got me excited about it. And I think also just kind of set me kind of a base of an idea in terms of what I wanted to do as a caller. But I've learned from so many other folks at the local level, not just in the USA, but also in Australia, that really has helped me develop into the caller I've become. And do they have the games on TV over there as well? Or do you have to sort of stream it online? How does it work over there in America? For both of them, there is a pay system uh, where you can go and uh, you know, streaming online and you can watch all of the games live and on demand. I would say that, so all of the games here, at the very least for this season, they're on a pay channel. I would say about maybe $10, maybe $15 a month, but there is a handful of games around, I would say three or four games around, depending on what the other TV schedule is that's on uh, that's on uh, the Fox Sports channels uh, that are on. There's one that's on in 90 percent of homes across the country, and there's one that's on, I would say, about 50 percent of the homes across the country. So there is the opportunity for folks who haven't seen the game to come across this. And that's one of the things I do online is I go and I say uh, I, I trawl, T-R-A-W-L, as opposed to trawl. Uh, for people online, uh, just seeing who's talking about the game. And, and um, you know, if they're based here in the U.S., then I can say, hey, you're in New York, go check out the New York Magpies. Hey, you're in, you're in uh, Houston, go check out the Lone Stars, that sort of thing. So that, that I think helps as well because it, it really takes a game that not a lot of people know. And then if you have somebody kind of, not over their shoulder, but just kind of somebody just kind of poking them and saying, hey, you know, you like this here, you, you, can, you can explore it more on your own. And what about sort of AFL games, like, you know, for the Australian point of view, do you, I presume you get the AFL Grand Final live over there as well? Yeah, we do. And and many of our clubs um, hold fundraisers uh, around the Grand Final. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I've been so uh, outspoken uh, about it main, being maintained as a day Grand Final, because the time, uh, it would be at about 12.30 p, I'm sorry, 12.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. The reason that's so imperative is many of our clubs, especially here on the East Coast of the U.S., we have uh, fundraisers, and it's usually the main fundraiser uh, for uh, for the clubs and for the season. Uh, there are clubs that you know, we're talking four figures in, in in many in many cases, and not only that, but it's the big. It's usually towards the end of the season. It's right before our national championships. It's a great way for people to get friends in. It's a happening. Uh, we've had people, even Australians, who happen to be on holiday. I know one grand final, actually it was 2018, it was the Collingwood Eagles grand, uh, grand final um, where the Melbourne victory, I'm sorry, the Melbourne United uh, basketball team happened to be in Philadelphia playing the Sixers and they came out to our grand final party and and uh, help, helped uh, raise money for our club. So oh, um, it's, it's, that's, that's, I think, the, and, and I think a lot of people, you know, when they say, oh, Americans, they, they only want one for themselves. It's about growing something at the grassroots level. So um, I'm hoping that they keep it as a grand final, a day grand final forever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you're actually playing footy yourself, Brian, were the coaches, were they from Australia originally or, you know, because how did it work in terms of school development and that sort of thing? Well, my um, my coach, John Loring, is American, and he's still coaching now. Um, I think he's been coached now about 20 years, and he is a real student of the game. Uh, he's been to Australia a number of times. He's played over there. But uh, I would say we're getting, I would say, uh, I don't have a hard number on this. I would say roughly half, if not more, of the coaches in, in the U.S. Uh, are American, and uh, they're interested in uh, learning the game. Uh, many of them go through the AFL accreditation and and want to learn more about it and, or, and, and do that. So we do have a lot of Australians that come over and coach at the same time, but they're also bringing up this next generation of uh, players and player coaches who want to learn and want to be involved at, the, at that coaching level too. And speaking of exciting things, there's just been recently announced that Tasmania is going to be getting involved with the USAFL. Tell us about that and, and how exciting that is for, for football in America and, and in Tasmania. Well, it's the, it's the Department of Industry that's actually sponsoring us. And it's a great opportunity, I think, for us to kind of uh, promote uh, Tasmanian businesses uh, and uh, for them also, I guess, to promote us. And we're lucky in a sense because one of our clubs, the North Texas Devils, has a, has a working relationship with AFL Tasmania. So they're especially excited about this. Uh, no, it, it's a great opportunity, I think, to kind of get our name out there. I was 
a, a little bit taken aback in a good way that we that our the USAFL and the logo and everything was on the front page of the newspapers there, which I think is. Uh, it, it's really good because I don't think a lot of Australians know about us and, and uh, they don't know that the game is played outside of outside of Australia, let alone, you know, Victoria and South Australia and, and, and Western Australia. And here you have this league again, full of Americans, not, not, not just expats, but, but an actual sustainable grassroots program. And here it is. So uh, it's an exciting opportunity. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing where it takes us. Well, hopefully this interview today will, extra promotion they'll give you extra promotion as well for the competition and and it's nice to know that you know that we can do something to, to help you out with promotion brian I, i'm just astounded that anybody thinks i'm a, a legend of anything let alone sports <laughs> 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 i i don't want to name drop but um i mentioned sarah perkins has uh has come over here and and uh, been at our, our nationals and she had a she was asking me a question about something and it's kind of Still, it's a little astounding when you get a, a a message on social media from somebody like her, and the first words are "Hi, a legend." <laughs> yeah, see, there you go. It's one of it's one of those things. It's just yeah, like you don't have to have played two hundred games of AFL to be a legend these days. You can just be a legend of a bloke, which you are, Brian. So there you go. <laughs> and I approve. I approve. Listen, it takes one to know one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and we've also got a uh, another spoke before about Alex, of course, knowing him, but. Uh, Kylie and Josh Devlin, uh, Kylie I've known for a number of years. Her brother Danny's on Best Mates, and and Trevor, who is Kylie and and Danny's dad, actually suggested getting in touch with you because he's based in Tasmania and loves you know what you're doing over there in America, Brian. So a big shout out to Trevor. But uh, you actually know Kylie pretty well because she was playing for for Houston over there. Tell us more about that. Kylie and Josh and uh, the rest of the the Houston Lone Stars. And uh, what's interesting about them is they've been around about 10 years. And it was a a few years ago, it would have been 2017, that the folks who used to run that club, they've moved on to the national level. But uh, Dave Bryant and Sonia Lavelle, who are the longtime uh, presidents of, of that club, uh, they decided that uh, they wanted to start a women's program. And at the, you know, they're lucky because they had such a good relationship with the other clubs, with Austin uh, and with Dallas. Uh, at the time, those were the only three clubs. Now, of course, they've got North Texas, but they wanted to start uh, really a, a pan Texas club and then get it to the point where it built up to where it could expand into the local clubs. And they're, we're starting to head in that direction now. But at the time, they wanted to have uh, an identity uh, that would be, I guess, latched to this this one Texas club. And I had done, uh, I mentioned that I'm the in-house graphic designer. I've done a couple of the Nationals logos. I've designed for a couple of, of the teams. And uh, they approached me and they said, we want something that represents uh, this name, but we also want something that represents Texas. And uh, we came up with this cool little traditional, just the Texas heat with, uh, instead of, you know, kind of a, 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 a a uh, modification of the red, white, and blue. We went with a uh, sort of a faded red that looked like a coral of, of white, and then sort of a faded blue that looked sort of like aqua with a with a giant sash on it. And it, it's a uh, it, it's sort of a hybrid modern, but also something that uh, your grandma would want to make too. So, <laughs> <laughs> how good! I love it. And any sort of future stars playing in the competition over there that we might see playing AFLW or AFL one day, Brian, as well to keep an eye on. Well, there's a there's there's a few players that are that are really good. I think the the, the trick is is that uh, you know it's been very difficult with co- with the COVID situation. We actually had a couple of women uh, who were over there. Uh, we had uh, Rosemary Quoka who was playing for uh, was playing up in in uh, the Northern Territory and uh, had gone down and was actually looking at playing for Williamstown before the pandemic hit. And then she had to come back home. Um, April Lewis, who is on Essendon's list, went up and played also up in Darwin for the Southern Crocs. And then she came back home. And, you know, and unfortunately, it's a sort of situation where we, we do have some players, I think it would be really, really good. Um, it's just, because of the situation, but um, you know, there's, we have a lot of good young talent uh, players that are in their mid twenties and uh, hopefully they'll get an opportunity to go over and, uh, and show their stuff. Sounds very exciting. And, and yeah, obviously the, the amount of players that are, that are coming over, as you spoke about now to Australia that are coming from America, it's a credit to everyone involved over there for the development of those players. And it's really great to see because, you know, 20 plus 30, 20, 30 years ago, it was all about Gridiron and and NBA, which is obviously huge over there still in America, but it's really wonderful to see the 
the growth and development of the competition and now having this USAFL, which is super exciting, Brian. Yeah, it really is. And, and you know, the fact that we've been around now, I mean, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary and the fact that uh, we've come so far in, in so, you know, I guess a relatively short amount of time. And, and I think from a personal level, it's astounding to think that I've been involved for half of it. You know, I, I, I can't believe it. It makes me feel old from time to time. But uh, we're, we're getting there. I think we're a long way from where we eventually want to be. But by the same token, I think, uh, you know, we're a largely volunteer organization. There's only a handful of us that get remunerated for the, for the work that we do. And the fact that we've been able to, to sustain ourselves for so long, especially much more recently, considering, you know, we're, everybody's recovering from, a, from this global pandemic, I think is a point of pride. And, and uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, Australians, I, 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 you know, there's a very interesting sort of reaction when they find out about us. Uh, there's a, you know, folks that love seeing us grow the game and and uh, expand their game overseas, and there are some that uh, there's some that I think are a little bit worried that that uh, you know they're very protective of of their game and they don't want to see it become like other sports, like you know, I guess a more American influence. Um, I got into the game because it was different, because it was Australian, and I and I respect and honor that. And I know that just to a, to a, to a man and to a woman and to anybody who plays this game, they want to protect that as well because they got involved because it was something different, because it was something new and exciting and fresh in their lives. And, and, um, and, and I, so I, I don't think there's anything to worry about. This is an Australian game, but it, as long as your, your heart beats for this game, there's a place for you. And the Philadelphia 76 is obviously Ben Simmons has uh, been very controversial, um, not only there in America, but in Australia there's, there's been so much talk about um, what happened over there. We won't go into it, but do you get to many Philly games? To the Sixers, I, I would say um, it's been a, oh no, I went to one uh, right before the pandemic actually. And I actually, it was with the Hawks uh, because we uh, we actually had a, a good relationship with the Sixers while he was here. It was, uh, uh, you know, it's a good time with them and uh, the Sixers are fun. I usually go to the Philadelphia Union games uh, we have season tickets for the soccer team as well. And, and we go to some of the Philly, uh, Philadelphia Phillies games. And, uh, but, uh, and growing up, I was a big hockey fan. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, the whole situation with Simmons was very interesting, but, uh, I follow all the Philly sports. Now, Brian, before we let you go, my producer, Roy just came up with a wonderful question. Obviously we, we spoke before about AFL and AFLW and how it's, really growing over there in America. But what's the reaction of people when they watch a game? And I mean, personally, <laughs> I still don't understand the rules with, with Gridiron. I've watched it so many times, but I still don't get the rules. How do they go over there, understand the rules of AFL? And, and what's their reaction to the game? I think you'll find that most of the people that uh, referee Gridiron don't know the rules uh, to Gridiron as well. Um, <laughs> but the same with does, AFL. Does that, <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, does that sound familiar? Yes, it does. No, yeah. the, um, <laughs> y- y- you know, well, that's the thing. I think when they look at it, they think, it's funny because you know Australians, especially of late, they they don't think there's they think there's too many rules. Whereas when Americans look at it, they seem to think that there's not enough rules or there's no rules. I think it's uh, it, it's it, it is a little bit of bewilderment. It is a little bit of what is this chaos ball? And uh, but uh, once they get the idea of it, I think most of them pick it up pretty pretty easily. Um, you know, I describe it as a, a combination of. Uh, uh, soccer, rugby, football, basketball, volleyball, and a mosh pit. <laughs> That's a lot of things. <laughs> Do they also are they also amazed by how brutal it is too? Because I mean, I played Aussie rules for a number of years, and um, thankfully I haven't ever had any sort of serious injuries other than my ankles a lot of times. But um, you know, still copped a fair amount of hits, mind you. Do they are they in amazement that we're actually playing this game that's so brutal with no protection? Yeah, but I think the well the other thing is is they they confuse the sport with rugby a lot. And so they go, <laughs> "Oh, Australian football, that's rugby, isn't it?" No. But that's because a lot of them don't know the rules of rugby and they don't know the difference of that either. So I guess I guess there is they, they kind of put two and two together with that. All they know is that they play with a weird looking ball, they play it in Australia, <laughs> and they don't play it with pads. So it's got to be the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, exa- exactly. <laughs> Well, Brian Barish, thanks so much for joining us on Sports Legends of Bevo from America. It's uh, great to have your insight and I love what you're doing with the game of, of AFL over there and keep up the wonderful work and look forward to hopefully getting to meet you in person, whether it be in the States or here in Australia one day. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, mate. Thanks so much for having me. I really had a lot of fun. My pleasure. Mm-hmm.